All right, well, welcome everyone to our virtual discussion with Holland IQ, the future of ed tech. My name is Lainey Prelo. I am a senior client solutions manager here at LinkedIn. Um, and I have the joy of hosting our discussion today. We are going to uh, dive into the trends that we're seeing in the industry um, and what that means for you with uh, Holland IQ and of course uh, our own expert Joyce Lee. So before we begin, um, just a couple of quick introductions. We are so honored to have Patrick Brothers here today from Holland IQ. He is the co-CEO and the co-founder. Um, and Holland IQ is the, the world's leading resource for education market intelligence. Their research and data is used by governments, institutions, investors, and organizations to inform decisions from um, everything from lifelong learning to early childhood. Prior to founding Hall and IQ, Patrick was the CEO and founder of Navitas Ventures, which is the education venture arm of Navitas, and has held a variety of senior positions in sectors like education, infrastructure, and defense across Europe, Asia, and North America. So welcome, Patrick. And from the LinkedIn side of the house, we have our very own Joyce Lee. She is an enterprise account executive with extensive experience at the intersection of education, technology, and media. And so Joyce has spent a lot of this past year thinking about how LinkedIn is uniquely positioned to grow companies that serve the modern day learner and what that means. Uh, prior to joining LinkedIn, Joyce has held various positions at The Economist, CBS, CNET, and other companies. So she also brings a wide variety of experience and perspective to today's discussion. Um, before I hand it over to Joyce and Patrick, just a couple of quick housekeeping items. Due to the high volume of participants, please make sure that you are muted at all times. Please place any questions and or comments in the chat. If you have any technical issues, we have colleagues here to support you. So please notify us of that in the chat as well. Um, and your feedback is incredibly important to us. We will be providing you with a brief survey at the end. We would appreciate your honest feedback there. So Joyce and Patrick, we know that EdTech is becoming an increasingly hot topic among educators, parents, executives, investors. We know that in 2020 alone, uh, ed tech startups in the US raised over $2.2 billion in venture and private equity. Um, we know that the market is increasingly cluttered and that consumers are beginning to feel a bit overwhelmed with the amount of options out there. So we are excited to have you both help us unpack that today. And with that, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Lainey. And thank you all for joining. I hope you all are doing well and staying safe. So today we will be covering several related topics. Um, the EdTech landscape, first through the lens of LinkedIn's data, then a more broader view of the ecosystem and COVID-19's impact on both. We'll also be discussing longer term shifts, excuse me, longer term shifts we are seeing in the ed tech market and how this specifically impacts learning providers from traditional schools and online program managers to corporate training providers as well. And we received a plethora of questions beforehand. So we'll make sure we save enough time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. So to begin, it has now been a little over a year since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, which many of us are aware has triggered a seismic wave of disruption in the education industry. Online and remote learning is now mainstream and universally adopted across all levels of education and the workforce. In K through 12, about 40% of the core curriculum is digital. And when thinking about the supplemental curriculum, that is about 80% uh, digital. And we know that parents are taking the lead on 
purchasing a lot of that supplemental curriculum on behalf of their children. And the situation is similar in higher ed. We've long known these trend lines of the shift towards more of an online dominant format, but more and more students, at least on our lens at LinkedIn, are enrolling specifically in online and OPM programs. In the first quarter, we actually saw a 34% increase in enrollments from the prior year. We anticipate this growth to continue as we understand from a recent survey uh, that we conducted on our members last fall, that six out of our 10 members are actually currently inactive, excuse me, actively in market to um, invest in an online learning program in the first half of this year. Um, when thinking about the corporate landscape, um, you know, we're also seeing this rapid acceleration of digital learning growth, especially since there's this now transition from in-person instruction to now more uh, digital training-based kind of adoption. Um, so with that, you know, right now, 40% of all workforce learning is, is happening digitally. And from the LinkedIn side, um, around this time last year, with the peak of COVID, um, you know, enterprise learners were spending about 3.8 million hours um, on LinkedIn learning. So it is interesting to see that across the board, um, you know, these changes and adoptions will continue. Um, but in terms of thinking about if these trends will continue, you know, moving forward, especially now that, um, you know, we're in mid COVID and we don't necessarily know when this uh, kind of return to school will happen. And when thinking about in the higher education landscape, um, we see that the interest for, uh, you know, these non-degree online training options continue to um, have a lot of interest. So when thinking about or reviewing the keyword searches on LinkedIn, particularly from last month to the year prior, we're still seeing acceleration of um, this interest or kind of uh, interest to engage or learn more about these program offerings. And then in the corporate landscape, you know, it's widely known now that L&D business leaders are now getting more of a seat at the table um, within the C-suite um, as the need for reskilling and rebuilding kind of learning organizations within um, a company is a top priority. But what's, what's unique here is that um, what we're finding is not only are executives taking more ownership of this, but managers within core functional groups are also actively championing for learning for their direct teams. Um, so what that signals to us, though, is that there is now going to be more uh, a broader interest, perhaps outside even of the human resources function, um, where the need for onboarding new vendors or soft training softwares will be a priority. Um, some of the top functions that have deemed as very important for reskilling needs based off of um, a recent study or webinar that we did with McKinsey is um, sit within IT sales supply chain and procurement and marketing. Um, so while the past year essentially has created a nice penetration story, if you will, for many online learning providers and even corporate training providers, um, you know, it is widely known and accepted among all of us perhaps that these shifts to digital formats were already occurring in um, you know, the post-secondary and workforce landscape. But in terms of what we can think about um, moving forward and potentially what are some scenarios in the years ahead, can we expect these COVID boosts in this ed tech landscape to sustain? And will we also see a higher adoption of online education? So that's where I'm very pleased to pass the baton to Patrick. Um, and just some quick context here, you know, when serving um, kind of really like the ed tech landscape, um, I personally have not seen any other firm or essentially thought leader out there that has done a better job of providing some structure around a very unorganized and cluttered marketplace. So with that, Patrick, I um, will hand it off to you. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you so much. Very kind of you and wonderful to get those insights from LinkedIn as well. So interesting. Uh, Hello, everyone. I'm going to zoom out and do, let's just warm us up for some for some Q and A. Kind of dive into some of the insights that that we've seen through the period. What we're looking at right now is our forecast and our outlook for education technology spend globally. 
2019, we estimated it at $183 billion, which sounds like a whole lot of money, but it's only 3% of total spend in education, on digital, on education technology. Pre-COVID again, we kind of forecast that to reach 340 billion by 2025, which is a 13% growth rate, which again, sounds fantastic, um, but would only represent at the time, something like 4% of total spend. Post-COVID, and um, my team has let me know, I'm not allowed to use that word actually yet, it's mid-COVID. Our mid-COVID outlook, uh, we upgraded late last year. We had a lot of folks, just as Joyce was talking about saying, look, I know we're not through this yet, but kind of what's your take? And our take at the time was that we saw a significant uplift at the time, up to $400 billion by 2025, kind of a 16% CAGR, and that's across all education technology. What's driving that? Down the bottom, you can see we, we could all, we all worked through, are still in a short-term surge, but we're moving into a long-term transition. We're all reflecting right now and catching our breath, hopefully, to say, okay, now we need to get serious. It's now we go from reactive to proactive. We're going to see a massive digital infrastructure catch up. Um, it's many of you work in very sophisticated, advanced organisations that are way ahead of the curve. Most of the education market is really struggling. You'd be surprised how many schools still do uh, SIS on a spreadsheet, let alone in a book. Um, you'd be surprised how many universities are running off really, really old technology. Um, there is a big wave of digital infrastructure catch up. We're seeing a rise of B2C ed tech models. B2C has been a thing for a long time, D2C, B2C, however you're, you're phrasing it. But COVID really drove this wave of much more heavy parent involvement. Um, also students, adult learners seeking direct, fast, short, addressable learning. And then finally, we're starting to see, although COVID has, has somewhat kind of masked it because we've gone back to basics, is mobile and advanced technology enablers. Artificial intelligence has been working away furiously through COVID while we've all been uh, stuck, on, stuck on Zoom. Um, immersive technology, virtual reality, augmented uh, reality. It is happening big time now in healthcare in a whole bunch of sectors. Let's move on and kind of double click into education technology spend on the next slide. What you're gonna see here is the split in 2019 of direct to consumer on the left at the top and B2B on the right. You know, we started education technology for the most part, but not exclusively, was about supporting formal learning institutions with systems and technology. And then over time, education technology started to grow its own services supporting learners. Informal support, tutoring and test preparation, study preparation, through to the world that we see now where these are really fast growing and leading options. And then underneath that, you can see that split of spend across hardware, software, software services. B2C was definitely dominant in the last decade and the amount of sheer investment we're seeing backed by uh, investors around the world into direct consumer is enormous. And so we would expect to see that really power through the next five to 10 years. Let's keep going. I'm going to kind of put this into context in terms of the total spend. We've talked about education technology, but more broadly, you can see on the left side there, in post-secondary education, individuals around the world spend more than $2 trillion on post-secondary. That's higher education and vocational education. In our broader outlook, we actually saw tuition deflation in traditional, formal, offline higher education and post-secondary education. Prices have grown way beyond perhaps where they should have. Um, you've, everyone's seen that chart comparing the, the inflation of, of higher education versus every other category, and um, it's, it's got a little bit out of control. We also see the downward pressure from cheaper, faster, more credible alternatives pulling that price down. Even in workforce, corporates, Governments are spending nearly $400 billion on corporate training and upskilling, and we're all still trying to work out the definitions of those words as we move through into this new market. Online degrees 
as a contrast right now, or in 2019, we're about a $36 billion market. And that's growing really, really fast. And then alternative and micro credentials is a big market. But in comparison on this slide, you see that 10 billion versus that 2.2. And one of the questions that's on everyone's mind is how much of that 2.2 trillion could be served by alternative and micro credentials. We'll talk a little bit about that shortly. Let's jump into micro and alternative credentials. What we've laid out on this slide here is the typical size of an associate degree, bachelor's degree or master's degree in the US market. It does vary around the world, but, but not so much at, at the level that we're talking about now. And each little block here is like a class. It's um, a component of your bachelor's degree, as, as you see here. What's fascinating when we think about micro-credentials and alternative credentials is degrees are actually already cut right down into parts, whether it's a class or if you've ever been part of developing curriculum at a university, <clears throat> the hours are actually planned, believe it or not. Out of a 5,000-hour 5, bachelor's degree, um, hours are, are actually scheduled. And so in some respects, degrees are already big bundles of carefully selected and curated curriculum. On the next slide, we thought it was um, really powerful to overlay the micro and alternative credentials that we're seeing just grow so fast in the market and how they compare. So bottom left, like you can see Lambda's, Lambda Schools program there, super intensive, 40 hours a week for six months. That, that is a full on immersive online program. Western Governors University has an academy program, which is like an on-ramp to their online degree program. It's a small block. Uh, we've all heard of and be, been, um, you know, amazed by this Google certificate wave and story that we heard. We heard Google talk about um, Google as an employer treating their certificates as equivalent to a four-year degree. And you can see it only takes up four blocks there. And that's raised the question we've talked a lot about uh, online since that announcement is, wow, if that was a bona fide alternative to a degree, why would I not do something like that? Um, Coursera, Udemy, eCornell, Get Smarter, edX. I mean, you know all the players. I mean, they're all on this, on this call as well. Um, these are players that are building credible alternatives, micro and alternative credentials um, in the marketplace. Next slide, we're kind of sizing that out. You saw that 10 billion micro and alternative credential market on a previous slide in 2019, and we use 2019 purposefully. 2020 is a weird year. It's a surge year. Um, 2019 is a nice baseline in the old world. I um, can't wait to size 2021. 2022 might be more new normal. But you can see here boot camps, offline and online. I mean, boot camps only a few years ago were very predominantly offline direct to consumer. Since then, they've built you know, massive B2B partnership models and grown out in that direction. And one of the fastest growing part of boot camps is university partnerships, where universities have sought shorter, faster, industry recognized employment pathways. The fastest way to do that was to partner with a boot camp. We've seen for a long time this online non degree certificate post secondary micro credential market. All of the usual suspects you can see there. It excludes offline executive and continuing education, as Joyce talked about, with you know, the uh, L&D leaders and HR leaders, we expect to see a real crossover and intersection here with corporate training. We often forget professional certifications in this market, whether it's law with Barbary, whether it's finance with CFA, uh, all these um, industry bodies and professional certifications, if, you know, arguably are the original micro-credential um, industry recognized credentials, they're all moving online. There are big changes in this market. Keep an eye on professional certifications. And then finally, I'm, I have no doubt we've underestimated the size of this market, the online courses and badges market from LinkedIn's very own LinkedIn Learning, Coursera, IPO the other week. Uh, there are so many options here. There are so many exciting developments in this space as well. It's definitely uh, undercooked, there's a long tail here as well. Um, bottom line is this is a big and perhaps one of the fastest growing markets in education technology.
Final thought, just preempting a few questions, Joyce, is where is this headed? And on the next slide, one of the things we did throughout the first quarter of this year was really to uh, double click into the future of where we might see this head. There are a ton of open resources at, at holonoq.com if you want to really dig into this, but let me explain the four scenarios for post-secondary credentials that we started to pull apart. We saw two primary um, axes for how one might think about this. Left to right was, will it stay heavily bundled, big, episodic, or will it unbundle? Will it unravel? Will it come apart into much smaller bite sizes? Top to bottom was whether this space, the post-secondary credential space, very deliberately named, will remain predominantly government regulated, whether it's about the qualifications frameworks of every country around the world, or will we see the market dominate regulation, the consumer as the new regulator, if you like. So top left, we have what we call the greater whole, which is we go through this wave that we're in right now of unbundling and micro credentials, but what happens is we snap back because those are not accepted. Employers perhaps find it too hard to navigate just a gazillion micro credentials and they, they regress back to, no, we, that degree thing, actually, there was something really cool about that. Let's do that. Governments, we're seeing this in Europe. Governments are regulating the micro-credential must be 150 hours of content at a minimum. And so we're seeing moves there. Top right is micro quals, kind of the opposite. Higher education embraces micro-credentials and says that whole four-year degree thing that is so last century, let's chop that up into three-month blocks and you can build, you can stack, you can move. The degree becomes a former framework for heavily bundled. Um, of course, these are extremes. Bottom left, professions rule. Remember those professional certifications? It stays bundled, but the market drives this. So this would be the industry body saying, hey, uh, when it comes to law, when it comes to the bar, um, when it comes to medicine, when it comes to technology, when it comes to business, the industry associations actually win, but they keep the credentials bundled. Just like many of you perhaps have done a CFA, you do CFA level one, CFA level two, CFA level three, then you're awarded with your, your, your CFA. Bottom right is the opposite again, which is complete unbundling, complete fragmentation, completely driven by the market. It's where micro-credentials have matured to the point that it is just business as usual to take short, sharp, bite-size um, skilling when you need it, from, from whom you need it, wherever that may be around the world. I think... I, I have a question. Have that, mind. Around, yeah. Well, so, you know, typically in like a downturn, you know, enrollments are counter-cyclical. And so... And I think if you think about the last downturn, where I think what emerged um, as maybe per, dare I say, winners were those online schools that offered a lot more flexibility or accessibility to a wider um, kind of range of adult learners. If you had to predict, um, especially knowing that there are potentially these four, four scenarios in like the micro mm. alternative marketplace, would you bet that this would be one area that could come up to, up top after things kind of settle from things with, with COVID? Yeah, for sure. I think um, I really want to see the fall happen this year, fall enrollments, right, to get a, a good feel. But, you know, we, we're all kind of feeling it ourselves, whether it's for, um, you know, people in our lives, children, peers, friends. I mean, this whole idea of an alternative micro-credential just makes so much sense. Um, and as an employer as well, you know, I, I need to skill my people around the world and we can't huddle around uh, a table um, to do that. You know, we can't look at each other's screens left to right as we're working. And so we need a way to support um, our teams around the world and upskill them because as you mentioned and as a LinkedIn research at the, at the start kind of pulled out, everything's changing through this for us as well as, as workers. 
So um, absolutely. And then on the degree side, for sure, counter-cyclically, in previous downturns, we've seen people turn back to education um, to double down on their credentials, to double down on their individual value prop in this period, often funded by, um, you know, government subsidies to kick the economy uh, back. And I think we'll see that. I mean, online, sure, we might not see uh, from that $2.2 trillion, which for the most part, remember, it was only $40 billion that was online degrees out of, you know, $2 trillion-ish. I mean, that is tiny. And so, sure, we might not, the $2.2 trillion, a lot of folks are going to go back on campus. I know I would if I was an undergrad. I'm, I'm absolutely going back on campus. Um, but as an adult learner with a family, with a job, I'm upskilling, trying to get a promotion. I mean, I, I think online degrees, we are barely seeing the start. So then it does, it does seem as if then learners or consumers are very much in the driver's seat. Do you think then that the expectations for these programs, these varying programs, micro credentialing, certificates, um, any type of short course or boot camps, um, those expectations are clear. And I asked because I was, you know, you know, having a conversation with my colleague DJ, and you know, we were mulling over the idea, like, you know, is it widely known, like, for example, what a boot camp is and what you could potentially. Yeah. So if consumers, you know, are leading the charge and the market is, you know, crowded with a lot of supply or offerings, you know, how do you close that gap? Yeah, I think that's such a great point. You know, we, uh, dare I say, everyone on this call is a big early adopter in this space. Um, I, we just hired uh, an incredible woman out of a boot camp in our dev team, actually. And I was asking her too, like, how did you find the boot camp? And, you know, and I think for a lot of consumers, it's something new and they're saying, wow, did you know there's this program offered by this university in partnership with these guys who know so much about the space and I can get a credential and employers value? Like, this is new to the consumer, to the broad general consumer um, community, the idea that um, these really credible micro and alternative credentials, there is a we are, we are all way ahead of the curve. Um, and in some respects, that really pollutes our thinking about marketing these programs as well, right? Because the average consumer doesn't know about these um, alternatives. And education is caught up in some real social norms as well. I mean, who doesn't want their child to, you know, move up the social, um, the, the, the social ladder and get a degree? Right. Who doesn't want to be a first generation kind of higher education student? And so we've built some, you know, social structures that we're working through as well. But I mean, I tell you what, if if I was 18 right now, I'd be studying one of those Google certifications or <laughs> I'd be, be studying away on something short and fast that I can get into the industry, and improve myself. Totally. And then do you think employers are going to be like the near term or short term, like long term starting yeah. to accept, hey, like, you know, we see on your CV that you took these pluralsight courses or, and you, you know, complemented that with yeah. a UDEP kind of learning track. Um, are they familiar that this is potentially like in the works, this type of bundling? Yeah, absolutely. And I think we're seeing a couple of trends here. Of course, we're seeing... Um, we're seeing the, the evolution of the tuition reimbursement programs. We're seeing those programs at a degree level. Of course, there are some, you know, wonderful initiatives from employers around the world who are saying, let's sponsor uh, or let's support some of our employees to get a degree while they're with us. Um, but if you are the head of L&D, if you are responsible for outcomes and output and productivity, you need something shorter, you need something faster, you need something very specific. It might even be vendor specific. And so I think the old world of corporate training is perhaps one of the most disrupted in this space. It was once a long tail of very small organizations for the most part that didn't consolidate. And now, I mean, look at the takeoff of um, Udemy's B2B business or Coursera's B2B business or you know, I'm sure LinkedIn learning for B2B as well. And you know, how do I get all of my employees around the world access to, you know, training and upskilling that they need right now? 
uh, not in three years. They, they, I need them to learn system X and skill Y this month um, for the project that we've got launching next month. So yeah, big changes there for sure. Yeah, let's say you said, Lainey and I actually have observed this too, um, you know, with the kind of proliferation of software or being able to buy it directly in a kind of a direct to consumer type of transactional experience, individuals within large enterprises have the power to purchase software and that could very much be a learning right. solution. So um, right. I would want to pause a, um, I don't know if it's time to start taking questions. I'll ask our lovely hosts, but Pat, you had any closing kind of bits here? We'd love to um, hand that back to you. Look, the only um, closing piece I've got before we handed the floor is like, if I had to put myself in the shoes of uh, someone responsible for demand in one of these organizations. I think one of the things that would be tearing me apart, Mark, right now is there's this clear short-term opportunity around um, enrollments, uh, around, you know, my boss is probably saying, look, we don't know whether this is a one-off. We feel like it's a long-term thing, but go, go, go. We need to take market share right now. Uh, combined with this is a changing space and it's a crowded market and it's getting busier and busier. Like, you know, every university in the world is trying to work out what to do with micro credentials. Every player in this marketplace is trying to work out what to do with this space. And so I'd also be torn by how much do I need to build brand? How much do I need to build recognition? Like, how do I reach those consumers who don't even know what this is? They don't know what they don't know. And so I think that would be, you know, what I would be wrestling with if I try and put myself in the shoes of, you know, responsible for demand short term targets kind of long-term long-term brand that's my only thought kind of handing off looking forward to some of these questions yeah um Lainey um do you want to kick start for us yeah so thank you all for submitting your questions and if anything that um kind of comes up as we spend the next 25 minutes discussing please put more questions in the chat we're happy to um, include those as well but thank you joyce thank you patrick really really interesting uh stuff one of the questions that we got prior to this event was around early years and the trends that we're seeing there um can you speak to what you're seeing i mean we've spent a lot of time talking about post-secondary we've spent time talking about um you know online programs traditional degrees that kind of disruption but what are you seeing when you think of kind of you know pre-k pre-grade 12 the early years yeah so much i mean let me tackle those two joyce i'm sure you're seeing a whole bunch of things well pre-k you know most of the world think about pre-k as childcare, but so much of the world through COVID and now is thinking about it as getting ahead. Um, you know, Asia is absolutely leading the charge here. Uh, there is there are there are there are startups in China doing kind of language learning, English language learning for the zero to three years bracket. Uh, I, I had an investor who said that your chart is wrong. You've missed a whole segment. The zero to three category is like what zero to three learning English is like yeah. Um, so getting ahead, absolutely. We're going to think more about pre-K. We, we think less about pre-K as childcare, more about it as getting ahead. Uh, and then I, I have to say for, for K-12, you know, as I think about this space, I, I, I saw a wonderful post from Amazon the other day talking about, you know, the, the youngest certificate award. There was like a 13-year-old who had just achieved the kind of Amazon system administrator certification. It's like, Wow. This kid's 13 and he's already got an industry certification. And, I, you know, I talk to a lot of school principals and superintendents as well. And they're saying, I wonder if we could build microcreds into high school so that they leave high school job ready, already with certifications. Not the previous world thought of, you know, you do your 10, you do your 11, your 12, and that preps you for actually going to do the serious stuff. Well, guess what? Schools have to differentiate as well. And they're thinking about micro-credentials in that K-12 curriculum. That's fascinating. Yeah, I was going to add that in addition to 
kind of like the that micro format learning you know what we're seeing from our partners is um, engagement you know technology that's going to spur um, greater focus tracking um, and understanding like what those milestones are um, you know and being able to sell those technologies in I believe is um, somewhat taking a priority with a lot within the district level um, some preliminary research that we've done with a consultant before uh, mentioned that socioeconomic or understanding um, again like what are key engagement drivers is number one and then I would say second in terms of K through 12 from the district priority lens is uh, you know giving um, access to technology given that COVID has really exasperated that kind of economic divide or access to quality bandwidth or even um, laptops. So um, yeah, great question. Yeah. Yeah, and just kind of to follow up on that and think about it in a little bit different of a way, I think everyone is very aware of the push to uh, focus on STEM skills in early childhood years. But we also know that there's a renewed focus on social and emotional intelligence yep. and learning. And as especially as these solutions tend to become digitized and we're seeing online learning become more acceptable, can you guys talk a little bit about how the industry is kind of balancing those two forces as well. Absolutely. Joyce, you want me to jump in? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, everyone in the industry felt it right. We went through this big wave of STEM. Then we added A to make STEAM. And we're swinging back a little bit as well. And I don't know how many blog posts I've read about, you know, it's not about coding, it's about critical thinking and, and the like. I, I think this is just a, a, like a healthy, again, we're all on the bleeding edge, um, way ahead of the consumer. And, you know, most other parents I talk to when I've got my parent hat on are talking about Steam. They're buying a robot, they're buying a Sparrow, they're, you know, enrolling their kids in classes. I mean, through COVID, uh, you know, my daughter was doing, you know, piano lessons with a teacher who's never, you know, we've never met uh, on, on, on her iPad or with an app. So, again, I think, I think we're just seeing the beginning of this space. I think we all are way ahead of the curve, wondering about what's next or the consumers kind of playing a bit of catch up with us. And again, around other parts of the world, we've, we've seen that two governments who are concerned that they went too hard on maths and science and are now trying to swing back to the arts and cultural um, education aspects too. And uh, having said that, there are other governments around the world who see artificial intelligence as the competitive advantage of uh, the next 50 years and are trying to drive you know, massive education programs about advanced thinking in mathematics and and science too. So I think we're seeing a bit of everything. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of um, that event that we did with McKinsey Laney where, uh, you know, there is this balance, you know, they predict that um, the more uh, need, the, there's going to be a greater need and time spent around solving technical problems. But uh, there's also a greater need, like you mentioned, Pat, to support individuals so that they know how to socially and communicate um, you know, the problem solving that is heavily required in that. So I think a lot of our workforce data also shares or eliminates the kind of the same trend and that, that marrying of soft skills and hard skills is important. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, thanks you guys. I think that that is definitely a topic of interest from the questions that we saw come in. Um, yeah. So. Shifting a little bit, I know that another big theme um, from the questions that we have gotten is, is are degrees dead, right? And I know that's a very uh, bold statement, shall we say, but I think that's really top of mind for a lot of educators, right? Do we foresee, let's say in the next five years, a complete shift away from traditional education systems traditional degrees to, uh, you know, a complete acceptance of micro-credentials, of short course learning um, as a fully viable replacement 
And so I'm just curious to hear what you both think of that. Yeah, look, I, I think it's a big call. I don't, don't think degrees are dead. I think that um, degrees will be around forever. We might call them something differently, but the concept of a multi-year, like for undergrad, the concept of a multi-year um, program of study transitioning you from high school to work, uh, you know, I think that'll be around forever. And also in certain disciplines, um, and certain areas. I mean, universities, you know, go back and do a history lesson. Universities were so not intending to be what they are today. You know, go back 100 years. They were about research and about research fellows and about academia. And I think the unintentional consequences of uh, governments around the world said, look, we want everyone to get a degree. And because that was considered socially and economically that was considered a, you know we, you've 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 made it you know you got a degree and a degree is what employers use to filter out cvs and and that makes sense but we, we kind of feels like we're in a whole new paradigm right is uh like joyce said like will we see employers say oh wow you've done and passed the plural site program xyz and the assessment as well and if that's the case or if you have an industry certification in you know, program X, that means you have the skills, you've demonstrated the skills. And so, um, you know, universities, all the presidents that we talk to uh, are thinking the same thing, but there's kind of two schools. There's some presidents playing defense saying, we've got the degree, that's what's regulated, degrees of the future, we're gonna double down. We've got others saying, wow, we need to micro-credential everything here. Everything needs to be bite-sized, everything needs to be chunked. We need to be let anyone in the world take one of our micro-credential programs. And as soon as they get a block, they're alumni. You don't have to spend, you know, $100,000 in four years with us to be alumni. You need to have completed one of our short, short programs. And so um, degrees aren't dead, but you saw that $2.2 trillion. I mean, if 1 trillion was lost from degrees to micro-credentials, would we call them dead? No, they'd still be a trillion, but wow. That would be a massive change if the micro-credential market was a trillion dollar market and on par with degrees. I, I can see a world, I can see a credible breadcrumbs to that world in the next 10 to 20 years. I got a direct question that I think is a good follow-up to this. Pat, have you heard of universities lobbying against micro-credentials? Absolutely. What? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> we don't need to be shy. Like there are universities we see it in our polling who see micro credentials as a very evil threat to the you know and you know if you've been part of building a degree there is so much thought that goes into those programs there is so much you know wonderful um intellectual property and and the like but there are others who see the world changing and you know, we've talked to universities who are in the process of a whole of organization, massive transformation. Organizations who know, their strap lines now are about lifelong learning, or their strap lines now are about, you know, supporting learners wherever they are, however, however they want it, building, looking, going back and saying to the all of their deans, I want everything to be available at least as a 100 hour block. Um, but that is such a massive change to, to, to uh, and, and socially as well, like we talked about, I think we underestimate how much as a society we unintentionally or unconsciously or, or otherwise actually bias the degree. Um, and we need to change too in order to su support the change if that's the direction we, we want to head. And so, Patrick, I think you touched on something really interesting is this idea of increased competition and the need to evolve, right? Especially as we think of kind of traditional education institutions. And so um, I think one of the big questions on a lot of people's minds is when you think of the increased competition that these micro degrees or micro credentials have placed on traditional degree programs, whether they're in person or online, what role do you think learner outcomes and being able to really prove and correlate the actual education to a tangible 
you know, beneficial outcome play in the ability to eventually win in this space? And, you know, I think you, you know, kind of as a corollary, how does that differ in the US market versus emerging markets? Because, you know, one of the things you touched on is that we have within the US society an incredible bias towards a four year in person traditional degree. Yeah, such a great question. I think, I mean, it's kind of the ultimate test, right? If as a hiring manager, like if, let's assume that all of this is actually 95% of this is, is people who want to improve their ability to generate economic security. If that's the case, if you can prove outcomes, you've won. Like as a hiring manager, we sadly filter by these signals because there's nothing else to go off. Uh, and because socially it's, it's accepted, you know, it's really sad, but actually most hiring now is still filter out anyone who doesn't have a degree or credential X, pick the ones from the better brands. I mean, that, that's actually the process. Whereas, and we hear a lot of, uh, I mean, I will, I will shoot myself if I hear another person ask about completion rates in MOOCs and uh, <laughs> short courses. Like, it's not about that anymore. It's about, Lainey, what you just said is proving outcomes. Like if as a hiring manager, I knew or I thought or I see it or saw and there was evidence of, you know, learners completing a program and having those skills, I would fly flight to that option. And that's one of the issues that is plaguing higher ed. Organisations get graduates and they, they're not job ready. Um, and that's really, you know, damaging the efficacy of degrees. And we've seen that conversation play out um, We've seen that conversation play out everywhere. In the US, it is a very different market. You know, the US is obsessed with with brand. It's obsessed with um, the four-year degree. And and so are other markets, but at a at a level that is that is you know wonderful when it comes to social mobility, um, but detrimental when it comes to thinking about alternatives. And then that's why I, I see this real, you know. For my US team, and um, you know that, that that's I think one of the challenges or the the, the barriers to micro credentials is the social mobility signal of a degree. And of course, we all want we want to upskill everybody, and we want that to be a whole of society kind of upskilling. Um, but there are these other alternatives. I mean, if if you know one of my kids did a Google cert and got a job in uh, an amazing job in industry. Uh, would I worry that they don't have a degree? I don't think so. Like, but we will see, we'll see. Yeah, it's something that we're actually just starting to, you know, do some analyses on, but, um, you know, understanding learners who've completed, you know, particularly like a micro-credential program, like a boot camp or an immersive training, um, kind of all hands type of, a uh, offering, you know, understanding their career mobility afterwards, you know, if, you know, leaning on LinkedIn's data, you know, understanding if they change job titles, different industries, different companies, yeah. or even salary information. So that's yeah. been really um, exciting to see and um, the brainchild of, of our insights partner named Pavel. So hoping to explore a little bit more of that with him and some of our partners here. Awesome. Yeah, I think so. I think that's right. I think we also, I do it a lot is keep thinking of this in the old school traditional way about undergrad and then you know doing a postgrad cert to get promoted that's it's it's kind of really really changing like mm-hmm. i've seen some wonderful example of online learning of school principals um presidents uh superintendents from around the world who are kind of leadership is lonely and they need professional development as well. And online learning is allowing them to connect and share experiences and learn from each other, move through curriculum. Um, like we keep thinking that the dominant kind of media commentary is about the substitution effect of you know, undergrad, where it's so much more sophisticated than that. And I think we're finding, I know I'm finding personally, most of my learning happens you know, through life. It didn't happen in a 
chunk. I got a whole lot from that chunk at the start, but that seems to be like the biggest opportunity for, for everybody. Yeah, no, I, I love that perspective. Um, so one question that also just came through is around internship opportunities, the impact that they have, number one, in terms of advancement, but also kind of thinking of that as we think about their importance and how do you know these uh, companies, institutions, programs that offer micro degrees, micro credentials, short courses, et cetera, or that may be fully online, how do they fill in those gaps that they may have in terms of human social connections that a lot of times traditional in-person degrees or programs provide. Yeah, I, I love this space. I don't know about you, Joyce, but I think with all of my hats on, the idea firstly of experiential learning is huge. I mean, who doesn't want to learn something serious and on the job and, you know, industry grade? I mean, I'd love to uh it, it, love to love to do that and it's a great opportunity to to offer that as well um and then as an employer you know internships often get used as a screening mechanism as well um and that's the same for the learner right it's a great opportunity to you know it might it might have sounded like a great idea to work at that organization but once you got on the inside you're like whoa this is not what the poster said um and so uh, I think we're all wrestling with this as well. How good would it be to offer experiential learning? How good would it be to engage with industry in a way where those learners got exposure to real world projects and it was part of a, um, a screening process? I mean, if you think of life as a hiring manager, how good would it be to see how well some of these candidates performed in the role on the job without you know, having to go through a really enormous process and select one person and cross your fingers? And so I think everyone wants this space to work, but um, different countries really struggle with this about how they've managed apprenticeships, how companies manage internships, and then just socially how we as learners working through internships and organizations hiring people go through that process. It's, it's also a delicate area that we don't want to mess up um, because we're talking about people's lives um, here. So Awesome opportunity. Virtual internships have been huge too. I'm sure everyone's seen this, that companies offering real world projects through an online experience, you get to experience what actually happens, what the expectations of that organization might be, what kind of work you would have to deliver and the outcomes you would have to prove um, as part of, a, you know, feels a bit like online learning, feels a bit like an internship, feels a bit like a job interview, great upskilling opportunity as well. There's something definitely in the intersection of, of all those things. Yeah, I'm pro apprenticeship, especially as if we're moving more towards these like individualized learning paths. You know, just um, from my like experience, you know, vocational schools versus yeah. uh, more traditional schools that are more academic or research focused, which I will argue is very much, you know, the UC system, the University of California system <clears throat> versus the California state system, which leans a little bit more around, hey, how can we place individuals in jobs? And, um, you know, when I graduated during the Great Recession, I remember thinking it was very unique to see those individuals that um, graduated from the vocational schools all landed jobs. But while, you know, that financial crisis really hit hard and it took, you know, I think on average five to maybe eight months or 12 months, even longer for new grads to get hired and shifting to just last year, you know, I think many of my colleagues in our, you know, in our this business, you know, we have the gifted perspective from all sides of the business of university from of course, like driving enrollment, but oftentimes we engage with the students themselves. And I thought it was, you know, quite astonishing to hear that, um, you know, almost grads, seniors or juniors, you know, they had internships lined up because of COVID, those internships were scrapped. And they were reaching out to me to understand what would be a good alternative to supplement that experience. And, you know, I think a couple of things are like, of course, building your network, utilizing, you know, a professional networking site like LinkedIn to do that. 
Um, but the idea of also taking um, a short course was new to them as well, because you know they wanted to supplement their educations given it was pass or fail. And they felt, you know, they felt this looming sense, at least from my perspective, that they were going to be unprepared once this was all over and once it was time to graduate. So um, I do, again, to circle back, that whole need of doing apprenticeships or internships, I think is a key component, um, especially as we move more towards, again, these online only centric paths. Yeah. I love that. Very, very well said. So um, I know we have three minutes left. I think one more question should do it and just being mindful of time. Um, if you can keep your answers as concise as possibly. Um, while they're answering this, you hopefully have also seen a um, feedback survey pop up. If you don't mind, please providing uh, us with some feedback in terms of how helpful you found this webinar and how likely you would be to recommend it to a colleague. Uh, but while everyone's filling that out, Patrick Joyce, last question for you. How should ed tech professionals, marketers be thinking about lifetime value, especially these companies that, you know, play both in kind of the direct to consumer and B2B realm, right? That we do see with a lot of uh, ed tech companies, they, you know, once you can get someone in the field with their foot in the door, maybe through a freemium model or something like that, they have a likely a higher likelihood of going on to be an advocate for you with a B2B, you know, within a B2B purchasing decision, things like that. So just any thoughts on how ed tech companies can think about lifetime value of a, a customer? I'm, 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 I don't know whether I'm answering it specifically, but you know what I was thinking is like, we all know you, we all love you, we all track you. The consumer, just do not assume that they do. It's mm -hmm. like, don't assume that they know who you are. You think you're amazing. We think you're amazing. The consumer probably doesn't even know who you are or what you do. This is a new world, right? It's, it's, a, it's a new chapter. I'm sure you've got a gazillion website views every week, but again, they're early adopters. They're, it's probably Joyce and I, visiting the website as well like you know you, you need to establish presence and brand in this market lifetime value will come from being recognized in this crowded marketplace as someone who delivers outcomes for the learner and as a consequence for us all as employers yeah i'd echo that and i'd say just you know understanding the learner and their potential path that would make them most successful. And maybe that means a little bit more screening up front or um, due diligence on the provider side. Um, but I think with that, like there's that the, the there is still like a gap between understanding expectations and what the real experience would be. And um, I think content marketing and um, storytelling and success stories can help close that gap. Yeah. I love that. Well, on that note, thank you both. We are at time. Um, thank you everyone for joining. You should be receiving a copy of the recording and slides from your LinkedIn rep sometime next week. Um, and if you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out to any or all three of us. All thank right. you all. Thanks everyone. Thanks everybody.